Kim Bowie Chung was born in Singapore in 1965, a time when the country was rapidly modernizing. In this poem, he lampoons the idiocy of Singapore's approach to maintaining an armed force. In 1967, mandatory military service of between two years and two and a half years was introduced by the government and was deeply unpopular among the people. However, what makes the Singaporean system special is that even after completion of this service, every male has to serve as a reservist and attend annual training exercises to maintain their fitness and military readiness. This service is something that Kim Bowie Chung would have had to go through, and it is clear that he resented the commitment, felt that reservist training was a completely pointless requirement, and that the whole thing was really just dreamed up as a fantasy age by political leaders. This eventually, along with other reasons, led him to move to Sydney, Australia. Time again for the annual joust, the regular fanfare. A call to arms, the imperative letters stern, as clarion notes, the king's command, upon the pain of court-martial, to tilt at the old windmills. By definition, fanfares are ceremonial tunes played for people or events of importance. However, the usage of the phrases time again, annual, and regular counteracts the notability and uniqueness of a celebratory tune, causing it to sound repetitive and ordinary, reflecting the feelings of being reserviced. This is accurate as in Singapore, once a man joins the military, they are required by law to return every year until they turn 50 years old likely diminishing their enthusiasm and passion. The poet uses nouns like imperative letters, clarion notes, and the king's command to create a sense of importance and urgency, as back in medieval times, these were all immediate notices of an incoming or ongoing war. However, this built-up anticipation is crushed when the poet reveals to us the objective, to tilt at the old windmills. This line refers to how Cervantes Don Quixote deliberately attacked windmills, thinking that they were enemy knights. Bowie Chung's reference here serves to link Don Quixote's lunacy with that of the Singaporean politicians who were living in a fantasy. The windmills may specifically reflect the fact that any enemies they imagine Singapore to have are non-existent while the reservists represent Don Quixote, and as such are not a very intimidating military threat should it ever come to it. Overall, the opening lines uses a language associated with medieval warfare and kingship in sarcastic flattery of the Singaporean leadership. Although the imagery of an annual joust greeted with fanfare seems to convey a jolly feel to the proceedings, it also makes this element of the Singaporean military force sound like a silly game of leaders, commanding their armies to fight windmills with threats like the pain of court martial. With creaking bones and suppressed grunts, we battle-weary knights creep to attention. Ransack the wardrobes for our rusty armor. Tuck the pot bellies with great finesse into the shrinking gear. And with helmets shutting off half our world, report for service. Let's start off with the irony of our rusty armor. Armor is built to protect, however, rusted they are useless. This reflects how the once strong, fit and young soldiers have grown old and weak. We hear the creaking bones and suppressed grunts of bodies that are increasingly unable to comply with the demands put upon them. Pot bellies are stuffed into shrinking gear, and heads with ill-fitted helmets are now shutting off half their world. Yet, they are all still sent back for service. Cheng does this not to shame the Singaporean reservist. He conjures his image to demonstrate their lack of suitability in general, and also to illustrate their disillusionment with being required to take part in this. The helmet shutting off half our world here represents military service, both in the sense that they have to return every year until they are 50, a good portion of their lives, and in the sense that the rest of their lives that make them who they are, are forgotten. We are again united, with sleek weapons we are betrothed to, in our active cavalier days. The poet here describes how as teens, first coming into the service, they were married off to their sleek weapons, and it has stayed this way for years to come. The fact that the weapons stayed sleek over the years could either suggest they were well maintained and cared for, or more likely, they were never used in battle. 
Cheng describes initial national service as the active cavalier days, which suggests that when men are young, there is some enthusiasm for his military role as a kin of romantic adventure. But one thing that is long behind them as a result of their bodies beginning to age and ache and at the same time because they have matured mentally and recognized the futility of their efforts or dreams of adventure. We will keep charging up the same hills, plod through the same forests till we are too old, too ill-fitted for life's other territories. The repetitive nature of the reservists' training is again apparent in this stanza. Keep charging up the same hills, plod through the same forests. Charging might suggest a level of enthusiasm or compliance, but plodding indicates that they are struggling to keep up a good pace and reveals their physical inadequacies. For the reader, this conveys the futility of reservists and draws sympathy and a sense of bored frustration for them as their exhausting duties are described. This feeling is further induced as they are said to have to continue their service till they are too old, too ill-fitted for life's other territories, suggesting that by the time the reservists can stop, they will have wasted their youths and never given a chance to appreciate life's other territories, representing their own adventures and interests. The same trails will find us time and again, and we kick to obey, like children place in carousels they cannot get off from, borne along through somebody's expensive fantasy land, with an overcoming rush or tedious rituals, masked threads, and monsters armed with the same roar. The first two lines here will present to the reader the consequences and impacts of such intense and repetitive training for so many years. Chung describes that the same trails will find them again and they are quick to obey. This creates an imagery of the soldiers as animals who are trained to continuously obey their master without second thought. The comparison to Pavlov's dogs can be made here. The Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov discovered Pavlovian conditioning by showing that if one brings food to a dog while ringing a bell, that same bell ringing by itself can trigger increased salivation from the animal. The reservists can be linked to this as them quickly obeying to the constant horror thrown at them is now almost like a biological instinct, conditioned by the government. In addition, at the end of the stanza, Chung describes the whole process as tedious rituals, emphasizing the pointlessness but also contrasting the perspectives of those creating the rituals and those enduring them. The contrast is further established with the perspective of the government describing their training as being on a carousel and in a fantasy land, seemingly like children playing a game rather than serious preparations when the soldiers are being tortured by mass threats from monsters. This conveys how out of touch politicians are with reality and the feelings of the public by the irrational fear of war. In the end, we will perhaps surprise ourselves and emerge unlikely heroes with long years of braving the same horrors, pinned on our tunic fronts. The start of this stanza gives the reader hope for their reservists perhaps one day emerging as unlikely heroes, braving honorable pins and badges on their uniforms. However, this is based purely on endurance and braving the same horrors of having to show up year after year to charge at windmills. Being given a medal for merely turning up undermines any glory of heroism and instead serves as a reminder of their years of struggle. We will have proven that Sisyphus is not a myth. We will play the game till the monotony sends his lordship to sleep. Cheng then compares the reservist's suffering to the punishment of Sisyphus to prove that the Greek myth was occurring in reality. The myth involves Sisyphus tasked in the underworld to push a boulder up a hill with the reward of freedom at the top. However, once he gets close, the boulder rolls back to the bottom as he watches and the cycle is repeated over and over for eternity. This extreme comparison puts into perspective how horrific life as a reservist is, watching all their time and effort totaling up to nothing. The comparisons of the government to a child is brought back in the next lines, stating that the reservist's monotony will be brought to an end once his lordship is put to sleep. This could suggest that eventually the government will realize the pointlessness of keeping and training reservists and abolish the program. Alternatively, this could be Chung gently conveying the idea of a revolution or rebellions to forcefully deviate from these absurd laws. We will march the same paths till they break onto new trails, our lives stumbling onto the open sea into daybreak. The shift of the tone from satirical mockery to hopefulness is apparent as the poem begins describing the possible future if or when the government's rules changes, forcefully or not. 
their service will march the same paths till they break, symbolizing brand new opportunities given, like a newborn baby stumbling ahead, ready to experience what life has to offer. Only when this change is brought about will there be optimism and enthusiasm from the Singaporean people as they will then reach for open sea and daybreak, representing the relief of liberation, freedom, and the beginning of a new era. Overall, in the poem, we're serviced by King Bowie Chung, uses multiple semantic fields, symbolism, metaphors, similes, and more to comment on the futility of the current Singaporean government's actions and decisions. He believes that the forceful training of citizens to become reservists should be abolished at all costs as millions of lives are wasted, dreams abandoned, and bodies exhausted, all for somebody's expensive fantasy land.